Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the GX panel discussion of the topic, Customers First, UAE Secret Recipe. The GX is a dialogue series aiming to redesign the future of government service experiences, where it unites government decision makers, global practitioners, and renowned innovators to re-examine and redefine government experience for the future. Every February of the year, the UAE government upholds one of the biggest innovative festivals in the world. Referring to innovation, please allow me to welcome today's panelists and today's discussion. Starting with Brigadier Khalid, the General Director of AI in Dubai Police, and Maria Paula Oliveira, the Chief Innovation Officer at EY, Saeed Nofeli, Director of M5, and Mr. Amin Zarouni, CEO of Sahab Smart Solutions. Before starting with you, uh, Brigadier Khalid, first allow me to congratulate you on behalf of the team for earning the, um, the award of the best executive director in the government departments. We're very proud of that. Thank you very much. The fact that change is constant in our daily lives puts forth the necessity to adapt an innovative mindset in our daily lives. So the context of today's discussion is going to revolve around innovation. Can you explain to us further how is AI playing a major role in enhancing a customer's experience when you deliver the services to them as a security and safety entity in the country? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for having me and to share uh, the experience and uh, the things that we have worked in Dubai Police uh, to increase the happiness of our customers. Uh, we have uh, established an AI strategy. Uh, well, uh, should be now we have in uh, reviewing it to renew it for the second uh, stage. We have uh, injected all the AI in all our transactions uh, to be uh, customer centric. Uh, means that uh, AI is a tool where it can predict uh, what the customer needs. It's a facilitate or a tool uh, that's going to help us to have uh, the right decision at the right spots. That's why we have uh, uh, put the AI uh, in the customer service and uh, the uh, crisis management uh, for the prediction of the c crimes, uh, prediction of the uh, behavior of the drivers, and uh, the all aspects. And as you know, AI is, is like a child. So whenever you teach him, give them more information, it will give you a better uh, outcome. Tapping into the point when you're talking about predicting crimes, I'd like to ask Amin Zarouni, as the CEO of the Sahab Smart Solutions, you've been the main arm in actually transforming uh, reactive services into proactive services. Can you tap into the subject more and explain how as a forefront, uh, as an entity at the forefront of digitizing services into smart ones. Can you kindly explain how have you transformed services from being reactive to proactive? Uh, thank you, Asha. And uh, we have been lucky to work very closely with the uh, Sharjah government on multiple of the initiatives uh, to digitize uh, many of the government services and the citizen journeys in the Emirate. Um, there have been a revolution for sure and transformation for the services from e-services to m-services, smart services to digital services. And the change in world is not just for the sake of calling it a nice name. There is a big transformation that happened for an e-service to a digital service. And um, the main driver behind that change is for sure an innovation. An innovation that happens on a different blocks of the value chain of the service, be it either as the input or an output or the process in between. Um, um, I would like to basically highlight an example of what um, I'm, I, um, you'll see that I will throw many examples uh, of uh, d d d during my talk today. It's, um, this is a very close project that we are doing with one of the big government entity in the Emirate of Sharjah, which is Sharjah Asset Management, that manages one of the big markets that serves the citizens of Sharjah, which is the uh, fish market. It's a very close project. It's an emotional uh, transaction that we used to do 
uh, when, with our grandpas and grandfathers and grandmothers when we go to the fish market and we buy fish. You know, if you move that service to um, an e-service or a smart service, it becomes a very easy online platform that you go and you start adding the fish to your cart and buying it. Now that is an e-service, smart, easy, quick, it happens. How do you move that to digital? And how you make really a transformation there? Now, to make a transformation in that service, you had to have add value. Add value to the buyer, add value to the stakeholders that are actually contributing to that service. And that value can be either in the experience or it could be in the process itself. Imagine when you are actually going and try to make that transaction, that order starts to speak to you and tell you that, hey, I'm a fish, I'm a salmon that I got caught two days ago from Finland and I got transported in Emirates cargo yesterday and I will be in your plate tomorrow. Now that piece of information could be not relevant to me, but it could be relevant to a chef, it could be relevant to a hotel, it could be relevant to a certain stakeholder that will be interested in getting that value. And as an experience to add on top of that, imagine if you are buying a fish, for example, I talk about myself, I don't know all the type of fish, are they good for being grilled or being fried or being, you know, what is the right way of doing it? But if the service is actually educating me by giving me that value and introducing the spices to me and contribute to that experience that I'm having online, then yes, this is a huge transformation. And it is just an innovation that happened. Not for, I didn't change the technology. I just changed the experience, and I made an innovation on that service that could have been very basic, just adding to the cart and buy and pay and it get delivered, while I just made that, uh, that different experience for the buyer. So you kind of monetize the product for customers. You kind of deliver the service and simplify it. Did you actually hunt for those ideas in the market? Or do they apply? Like, I mean, like, do the startups apply to you just like in Saeed Nufali's case? So he has an enabling platform where entrepreneurs would apply with their startups. So can you tap more into a means point? So it goes another way around with him and you. So if you can yeah. clarify more on your role. Yeah, thank you, Aisha, for, for this opportunity to talk uh, uh, in this uh, panel. So yeah, from, 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 from our perspective is we bring uh, companies and ideas and support them to go into the market and support the government sector or the private sector. Any idea that comes in, we incubate it, support it, and enable uh, whatever opportunities are there. So in this case, we go into, gov we have a startup that supports uh, the government sector when transforming them into an AI uh, bringing AI solutions into it. So it depends which sector and where. Most of our startups or most of our entrepreneurs are actually um, uh, employees that come from our business parks, that they found opportunity and found uh, a problem and they started solving it. And this is why they're pumping in. It's not like they're sitting somewhere. No, there is different people coming from all parts of the world, finding opportunity and trying to find the market for it. So even when they're innovating, Innovation is not, uh, um, is that I, I have arrived. No, it's an ongoing process. 90% of our startups are actually don't know their business model. They're jumping in and then they start in finding that business model within. But they have a problem that they're trying to solve. Can you tell me more about how could the government entities actually capitalize on the opportunities of the startups that appear in front of them. So what opportunities do you offer to the startups from different sectors? What, do you, what are some advice and insights you can actually present to the government entities to capitalize on these opportunities? I think from a government's perspective, because uh, I've worked on two sides, I think uh, government need to be more open into fostering and bringing innovation. Uh, let's say uh, we have, let's say Mercedes-Benz and all these global companies who are at the front when it comes to technology innovation. They actually go and sit with startups and work with them uh, in order for them to develop. I've worked in, uh, uh, you know, uh, defense and security and so on. It was previously the process is, oh, show me the product. You have it, show me. But that doesn't work. It has actually been both sides talking and trying to find ways how they can enable that innovation in that space. It could be used or uh, in a different application, but hand in hand together, they need to work on. And this is 
the education that N5 comes in and says, listen, uh, Mr. Government or Mr. Uh, uh, you know, someone from the government sector, um, these startups behave in this way. You need to understand how they work. Because it's not like, okay, show me what product you have, I'm going to buy it, or you, I don't. No, it doesn't work that way. And this is why, you know, we keep on improving by listening. And this is why I always go to government, uh, 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 you know, government uh, uh, leaders or uh, people in, 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 in government and private to try and educate and make them understand that this is an ongoing process for us to develop. And this is how you really push innovation in the front. So talking about actually creating that environment for innovation, coming to you, Maria Paula, MP. Thank you. Uh, having an extensive experience, more than 15 years around the world, Latin America, the Asian Pacific, the Middle East, and the USA, how do you think the region here is different with innovation from your point of view? Uh, thank you, Aisha. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It was uh, awesome to hear some interesting point of view. I see I have a lot of wind here, but... Uh, so I think in terms of innovation, I think it's fascinating that we are in February and every February it's Innovation Month in the UAE. And for me, when a country designates a month, a whole month to talk about innovation, to think about the future, to design the future, it's fantastic. I've been a corporate innovator, like you said, for the last 15 years of my career, and that's what I do. I'm the innovation leader for EY, Ernest & Young in MENA. And uh, being here, it's just phenomenal for me. Here we have the Museum of the Future. We have Area 2071. Abu Dhabi, we have uh, Hub 71. In Sharjah, I went recently on the Entrepreneurship Festival. So it's all these efforts, concerted efforts, that really bring to life the intention of innovation. Because with individuals, with companies, and also with, private, with, with public entities, a lot of times we talk about innovation on a very theoretical level and say, oh yeah, innovation is important. But what are you doing about it? And this is so common to have this disconnection between the intention of innovation and the actions of innovation that we have a term for it. We call it innovation theater. Is when you say it's important, but we don't do anything about it. And I think uh, here in the UAE, I have experienced completely different. I have experienced innovation in action in all spheres, in private spheres and in public spheres. So it's fascinating for me to be here. Talking about implementing and thinking about ideas and actually executing them, uh, Amin, can you kindly explain to me the transformational role, actually, of transforming a service from being digital into purely a smart one? Can you give us some live examples other than uh, a commodity that a customer would want? Something more related to the corporate world, so an idea that came up and was really in need at that time to be in a smart mode. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, again, just, just to be very specific, um, um, when we talk as a digital service, we as engineers by nature, we focus a lot on re-engineering the process itself. And we think by achieving that, we are actually created an innovation. That's true, but that's not the only aspect that you look at when you look at a service. There's this very important aspect which I touched into into the first part which is the experience part and the experience which all the consumers and citizens are interacting with be it their pain areas be it an additional value that we are bringing be it an enhanced experience that they are getting an example to that is another uh, initiative that we are executing very jointly with the government of Sharjah which is centralizing all the government services on one platform. We are calling that digital charger, very simple, a very classical name, uh, I guess. Um, uh, but the beauty there is that we are not looking at microservices only. We are looking at macro-services that consist of many microservices. As an example to that, if an investor come to the Emirate of Sharjah and would like to open a business, they either need to know all the government entity that they need to interact with, or logically, they should not care how many government entities they're going to interact with. Literally, they should not care. They should go on one platform, say, I want to open this business, and that business is this type. And the platform should kick in the back, interacting with the multiple government entities for trade license or for NOCs. 
For example, right now, if somebody wants to open a restaurant, the first thing he will do is go and get a trade license from the economic development department to get a trade license for a restaurant. But why is that the first step? The first step should be, I want to open a restaurant, not get a trade license. I want to open a restaurant. And the platform should tell him, you need a trade license, you need NOCs, you need drawings, you need uh, review of an architect, etc. And all these services get executed in the back without him actually care which are the government entities that are interacting with. This is, this is a transformation when it comes to the experience of the consumer, how he's interacting with the government services. Um, consolidating multiple microservices to create a macro service that generate much more value and enhance the experience is, is what creates a service as a digital service. Since we're highlighting examples today, uh, Brigadier Khalid, if you can highlight Dubai Police's uh, efforts with Expo 2020 in raising the safety and security standards right. over here. So please, the floor is yours. Um, as you know that uh, in Dubai Police, we are so aiming to increase the happiness of the uh, customers, increase the safety, and we want to be the safest city in the world. And uh, we are so lucky we're living in this country. We do have more than 200 nationalities living in one city within the different uh, culture. Um, we have introduced a different kind of uh, projects, uh, which is customer-centric. And we have re-engineered the whole process. We do have established uh, a happiness, uh, happiness center uh, we are looking for all uh, the requirement of the customers. So whenever we build a service to a customer, we always interact with them, take all the feedback. And that's why Dubai Police application had won uh, for the seven years continuous the best uh, smart uh, application. We have also introduced what is, what is called a smart police station where it is uh, all those uh, police station is unmanaged. Uh, they won't find any police officer sitting on those police stations. In Expo, we do have a three smart police station um, in, in this area, where provide more than, than uh, 33 service. We have a project in Dubai, which is called Ayun. It's an Arabic word of an eye where we have connected all CCTV cameras in the region, in Dubai, and even across all the shopping malls, all the attractions, where we are monitoring all uh, misbehavior. Um, if there is any uh, crime, will be predicted. And even during COVID, uh, a lot of people start wearing a, a mask. So uh, our system couldn't uh, match any wanted person because people start covering their faces. So we have uh, trained the system to upgrade the system. So now it gives us an accuracy more than 90%. Even if the people wearing their mask, we can know who is that person, if he's wanted or not. That's why we have increased the technology, increased the happiness. And by the end, we always facilitate the service. That's why we won't find a lot of police officers in the area. Everything is managed uh, remotely. And everything is uh, sending all the kind of alarms to our operation uh, department. And even we have increased also uh, our petrol cars with the latest technologies. The, the petrol cars is... Uh, uh, injected with the latest technologies of cameras, so it can predict wanted vehicles, uh, facial recognition. Uh, in the olden days, the police officer, while he's driving his vehicle, he have like a routine shift, he have to go on a specific road uh, without any guidance. Nowadays, the system will direct the police officer where are the areas you should cover based on historical data. That's why we have increased the, uh, the safety measurement uh, uh, in Dubai. And we always, we have a 17 point that we should uh, think about the customers. And that's why we're always looking and uh, review all those 17 points. Miss, the most important thing that customer, he always be right. And uh, that's why uh, 
a lot of people they are saying, how come your guys Dubai police and you have won a lot of awards? <laughs> and imagine that the person who is paying the fines, he's happy for paying those fines. Because why? Because in Dubai police application, once he starts paying the fines, we can uh, direct him and he should have to choose where his fine should be paid to, either for education, is it to support the infrastructure in Dubai, um, uh, for uh, any kind uh, which is related to the economy itself. So that's why we always interact with those uh, things. Thank you for the examples. It's really interesting how the technology of facial recognition can actually go uh, higher with such a challenge. That's how you tackle it with innovation. Uh, Said, you mentioned Mercedes-Benz and how it's capitalizing on certain ideas with entrepreneurs. Since you're running this incubation center with more than 200 projects and entrepreneurs in their growth stage, can you give us a specific example of a company that actually offered really unique solutions to, for example, a government entity or any other stakeholder in the country? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been this, in this space for the past eight years and I've uh, seen more than 500 startups uh, 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 going through this incubation uh, and go to market. And I'll give you a great example. In my previous uh, 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 job in, in Sharjah, uh, working with Sharar, is um, we, a, a group of, of students came and, and, and discussed that they want to clean, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the ponds uh, in Sharjah. And then we, we worked with them in order for them to develop, uh, uh, you could see, a uh, uh, a cleaner, you could say, a boat that controlled by remote, and we pushed it into the water. And, and we worked closely with BIA in order for us to uh, run a pilot. So this is, this is an example of innovation. It came from an idea, and then it turned to a product. And they continued to discuss and how they can develop that. Another great example, same thing with students who came, uh, graduated from Emirates uh, Aviation College. They came to me and said that they wanted to create this uh, biodegradable um, uh, tray for uh, uh, airlines. So they've been discussing with Emirates Airline and Etihad Airways. And they saved airlines 50 million per year just because of the weight. It was 90% lighter. So these are the examples. We have another startup uh, uh, in the um, agriculture tech that they came in with a solution. Uh, it's like a sort of a mud that you apply it and they, uh, uh, the, the, it preserves the water. So you can actually make the desert green. And they got a lot of investment in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and, and they graduated. But these are the innovation that we keep on seeing every day in, in, in our space. Uh, today, before I was leaving the office, there is two startups doing blockchain with music. There is NFTs. So these are the things that are coming in and we are happily supporting them because we want to listen, see where are the opportunities, who we can connect to. And this is the beauty of it. Being in a business park that you have all these mega companies are you know, running business and governments, how we connect these startups to, to bring in innovation. And this is why it's important and I keep on saying that I understand because I was an entrepreneur and I failed. but. Uh, it's my duty to take these startups and also educate the uh, 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 government or private sector how they can work with. I'll give you one great example. Um, uh, there is a company called Parsons Engineering. Maybe some of you know them. Uh, they are the ones who are developing all the uh, metro stations in Dubai. They came to us and said that we want to experiment uh, innovation with your startups. And we started this pilot and now it's running on the first third version is them looking at our startups and them being a global company, how they are able to introduce our startups to the government and the private sector. And it has run so successfully that their uh, global uh, 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 leadership are coming to Dubai to look at this model and take it to the world. And this is what we are trying to do. It, was, it started with an experiment and now it's growing so much that they're taking it across the world. It's really amazing. Uh, there's one point I'd like to highlight, since you've all talked about technology and how advanced it is, and how innovation is a very important component in developing services, especially service delivery to the customers. Amin, can you highlight on one aspect that you've actually witnessed, which is the adaptability of customers to the transition of services? How have you seen that? 
Uh, did you encounter any certain um, challenges? Uh, did you uh, actually invest in some opportunities that appeared uh, while some customers were actually challenged by certain new services? Before I touch on that, I would like to add what, uh, to what Saeed was saying just now when it comes. There is no doubt that many of the innovation actually comes from startups. This is why we see many of the mega technology vendors are actually doing acquisitions for startups. Um, I would like to say proudly that when we started Sahab, establishing Sahab uh, with the government of Sharjah, we had a direction that we will be partnering with the startups to go to market. It, was, it could have been an easy decision to partner with the big technology vendors, but we know that the market is hungry and there is a big appetite to actually accept startups and try the solutions and the innovation that the startups are bringing. And the two examples that I highlighted initially, we are working with startups that are not older than two to three years. And we are injecting their solutions in the government uh, architecture of the systems that we are building for them. When it comes to your question, Aisha, when it comes to adoption, uh, it's very important for us to understand what is uh, the motive for our consumers to adapt the services or the solutions that we bring in. Um, our interest in the past, people interest in, changes over time. We had an interest in the past. If the service is available online, then yes, I will adopt that service because it makes my life easier. Nowadays, the, the motives are different. Uh, I'll just share a personal experience. There are so many delivery services available. I'm not hooked up to any one of them. I'm only going to use the one that's going to give me more value. I'm interested in the one that if I order two meals, the third meal will be half priced, for example. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. So it gives me a value, it gives me a different experience. So motives, people interest changes over time, and we need to understand that. We need to understand that also the people experience shifts and changes, and we need to always make sure that we touch into that point. So if we are addressing that challenge, and we, if we understand that challenge, first of all, that this is changing, we can start introducing a new customer experience, which is we can start introducing a new value that makes sure that our consumers are adapting our services. Going to a broader view of innovation, uh, MP, as a chief innovation officer, uh, actually fulfilling a role in a company that's actually co a conglomerate, so not only running in one region, but multiple regions. How do you apply innovation within the organization? But first, kindly clarify your role as a chief innovation officer at EY. Oh, that's a question that my dad asks me all the time. He's like, what exactly do you do? And he knows it involves a lot of post-its, but he has no idea of what I do. <laughs> and uh, as an innovation officer, uh, my role, imagine uh, human resources or finance or marketing. Those are corporate functions that oversee the, that particular process in a company. So as a chief innovation officer, I oversee the innovation process across all the parts of EY in MENA. There are other innovation leaders in other parts of the business. As you said, EY is a very big organization. We are in more than 150 countries and more than 3,000, uh, uh, 300,000 employees in the, around the world. So it's a, it's a very, very big organization. And uh, all the challenges that, that my, my fellow panelists here were describing, how to promote the dialogue between a big organization and, and a startup, or how to transform ve uh, an idea into value. I like to say that innovation is creativity with a job to do. So you give creativity a job and you say you have to generate value, you have to change, to change the paradigms, you have to bring money, put the money on the table, this is innovation. So what I do is work across all our service lines, all parts of our business, to ensure that they have what I call innovation muscles. The processes, the people, and the technology to thrive through change. So we were talking here about artificial intelligence and about uh, digital uh, processes and about incubation. Those are the current, uh, the current trends, the current things that are happening. AI is happening now, 
digital is happening now, but now we start, started talking about the metaverse, about the fourth revolution, about non-fungible tokens, about crypto. And those are forces that are nascent today, but they are going to be shifting the paradigms of what we understand around art, around commerce, around money, around government, around social organization with DAOs, around uh, businesses and the role of government within the next 10 years. I was talking to uh, Brigadier uh, uh, Razuki here and we said, how much has changed in the work of the police force in, uh, in Dubai in the last 20 years? And a lot more will change in the next 10 years. Because guess what, Halid? You have to police the metaverse now. And that's gonna be something else different. So as, as a corporate innovator and, and looking at uh, helping companies and startups and government in our role at UI, we're helping all of these entities to have those innovation muscles, to be able not only to survive change, but to thrive through change, knowing that whatever we understand as the current uh, forces that we have to deal with, such as digital, are going to be very different within the next 10 years. So concluding our talk today, can you kindly give us an insight on how to actually apply the innovation muscles? Usually with the departments, you've got many different departments as you have mentioned. How do you address them? Uh, like an example of a daily activity you would do with them. Yeah, so, so like I said, I see innovation muscles as three parts, the processes, the people, and the technology. So one thing that we do, uh, and I think it starts with the people, is doing actions that promote a more innovative culture. And a more innovative culture is a culture that involves a sense of community, so how do you involve your people in bringing the ideas that will shape the future? It involves trust, involves also the idea of failure. So how do you create an environment in which people can fail without disrupting themselves or the system? I'll give an example, and I, I bet there are others here in the, in the UAE market, but I was in Singapore before moving here. And in the financial sector, we have the whole elements of FinTech, right? So FinTech are really important. But if you have a fintech that is, for example, doing lending money or issuing credit cards and opening bank accounts for people and that fintech breaks, it could disrupt and create uncertainty in the whole financial system. So in Singapore, what the financial authority did was create the sandbox, create a space in which uh, the, the fintech startups could offer their services within certain boundaries. So this is something that is one practice. Another practice is doing hackathons or doing innovation challenges. Another practice is setting up labs to understand disruptive technologies and then understand how to bring them. And all those practices, like I said in the beginning, they require investment, they require leadership, they require resources. And I see the reality of the UAE is that those investments, leadership and resources are actually being put in place. And that's why I'm very confident in the future of this country as an innovative force in the world. Thank you so much for your insights. So Brigadier Khalid, thank you for being here today, MP, Saeed and Amin. It's been an amazing and beneficial talk today and I hope the audience actually liked it so much. So see you again next year in February and the next Innovation Month. Thank you.